next, uh, Richard uh, Baranek will talk, talk about a fine spline insights into deep learning. Oh, Mike, Max. Yeah. Uh, it's great to be here. Uh, can everybody hear me at the back? OK. Uh, uh, yeah, it's just great to be here. Uh, really looking forward at this uh, 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 meeting uh, uh, that is uh, part of a program on foundations of deep learning. And, and what I'd like to do is just talk a little bit about you know, some of the progress we've been making trying to find a, a language, a language we can use to describe uh, what we're learning uh, as we scratch away at these black box deep learning systems that have been promised to, to catapult us into, uh, you know, into the end of the future, right? And what I'm going to argue is splines provide a very natural framework for both uh, 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 describing what we've learned, but also providing us avenues for uh, extending uh, uh, both the design and analysis of a whole host of different deep learning uh, systems. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about a particular uh, kind of spline today. And then I'm going to give you a whole bunch of examples of, of how we've been using it to describe and, and extend. And of course, we're not the first people to think about the relationship with uh, deep nets or, or neural nets and splines. This goes way back to pre uh, the, 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 the previous deep net uh, winter. Uh, but uh, I think that we have a, you know, particularly, we've identified a, a, a collection of particularly useful splines for uh, uh, modern deep nets. Okay, so uh, just let, let's jump in and talk about the, the basic setup. So we all know that deep nets solve a, a function approximation problem. We're trying to use uh, training data to approximate the prediction function from data to uh, some prediction. Might be a regression problem, might be a classification problem. And we do this in a hierarchical way through a number of layers uh, in, a, in a network. And what I'm going to argue is that deep nets do this uh, in a very particular kind of way, using a spline approximation. So show of hands, how many people here know about splines? OK, so there's two. Uh, uh, key parts to a spline approximation. Uh, the first is a partition of the input space or the domain. So if x is just a one-dimensional uh, input variable, then we have a partition omega. In this case, we're splitting the domain up into four different uh, regions. We're now uh, the second important thing is our uh, local mapping that we use to approximate some, in this case, function. So we have a blue function we want to approximate here, and we approximate it. We're going to be interested in piecewise affine or piecewise linear splines by just, in this case, four uh, uh, piecewise affine uh, mappings. Okay, makes sense to everybody, but it's really this yin yang relationship between the partition and the mapping that, that works the magic uh, in splines. There's two big classes of splines. There's the really powerful splines, uh, for example, free knot splines. This is where you let the partition be arbitrary. Uh, and, this, and then what you do is you jointly optimize both the partition and the local mapping. These are the most, uh, allow you to have the uh, highest quality approximation. But it's important to note that they're computationally intractable in 1D. And in fact, in higher D, even dimensions 2 and above, it's not even clear how to define what a free knot spline is. So, so these are uh, something we'd really like to be able to do, but very, very difficult. T typically, what people do is they, they fall back to some kind of gridding type technique. And if you think of even what wavelets are, they're really just a dyadic grid approximation uh, type of spline. So what we're going to focus on today is a particular family of splines that we call, we don't call, that were uh, coined max affine splines by Stephen Boyd a number of years ago. And these were uh, developed just for the idea of pr uh, approximating a convex function with a continuous piecewise uh, affine approximation. OK, so let's do continue with this really simple example to just define a max affine spline. Uh, we're interested in approximating this uh, con convex function over R capital R regions. So we assume that we have R affine functions. These are parameterized by a set of slopes and a set of biases. We're going to have R sets of those. Here's an example for R equals 4. We have four separate 
uh, four of these distinct uh, affine functions. And if the key thing about the reason why we call them max affine splines is very conveniently, if we want to approximate a convex function by these splines, all we have to do is take the maximum the high, vertically highest, in this case, uh, uh, affine function. Okay, so if you think of these four affine functions that we've thrown down here, and we think of approximating this blue curve, all we're going to be using is simply the top, right, the piece that actually sits on the top. Okay, and so the really important thing here is that uh, uh, as, just by uh, fixing these four sets of slopes and biases, we, this automatically generates an implicit uh, 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 partition of the input space. Right? You, you switch from one partition region to the next whenever these affine functions cross. And that's going to be you know, really important for later. Does this make sense to everybody? Very, very simple. Right? And of course, this also gives a continuous uh, approximation. So let's just think a little bit about pointing towards deep nets without going into a lot of details. Just imagine if we're still in one dimension and we take our, our input x, we scale by a, add a bias b, and then pass it through a ReLU, right, this uh, operation here. Well, it's pretty easy to show that this is a max affine spline uh, approximation with r equals two affine functions. The first just being 0, 0, just the flat. Uh, function, zero function, and then the second being basically the, think of this like, a, like, like the ReLU, but now shifted over and uh, uh, with the slope changed by the parameter A2. Okay, so just this should get your, uh, yourself thinking about other deep net operations and whether they can be related to the max affine splines. We're going to define a max affine spline operator simply by concatenating K of these max affine splines. So you can think of an input vector now. We're no longer in 1D. X is in D dimensions. And then we have K different splines. The, and the output of each of those splines will just be one entry of this output vector uh, Z. And we're going to call that a MAZO or a max affine spline operator. So what's the key, key realization? Well, let's start by just talking about deep nets. Okay, if you think of uh, the lion's share of what the deep nets that are used today, uh, basically any architecture you can think of, uh, using uh, piecewise linear or uh, you know affine operators, fully connected oper uh, operators, convolution operators, leaky re leaky or ReLU or ReLU, uh, absolute value, any of these types of poolings. Uh, these are all built, these, the, the, the state-of-the-art methods are all built out of these kind of architectures and these kind of uh, operators. And it's actually pretty easy to show that all of these operators that comprise the layers of essentially all of today's state-of-the-art deep nets are max affine spline operators. Right? So you can think of then each layer of a deep net is just a max affine spline operator. Uh, and so that what we're doing is we're doing, a, we have a convex, uh, uh, approximation going on at each of these layers, and therefore a deep net is just a composition of max affine spline operators. No longer a convex operator, because composition of two convex operators isn't necessarily uh, convex. Okay, so so this is going to so we're just going to call this an affine spline operator. It remains continuous, but it doesn't have this max affine uh, spline property anymore. Uh, just as an aside, if you wanted the overall net to be convex, uh, it's pretty easy to constrain uh, to show that all you need to do is just ensure that the uh, all of the uh, uh, weights in the second layer and onward are uh, positive numbers. Right? That guarantees that the overall mapping will be convex. Any questions about this? Very simple baseline stuff. Okay, so the recall, the nice thing about these, uh, th these particular splines is that as soon as you fix the parameters, right, the slopes and the offsets, wherever those hyperplanes or these defined varieties cross, that defines a partition. And that's really where things get interesting, right, is to think about the partitioning that goes on in these uh, max affine spline operators because that allows us to think a lot about the geometry of what's going on in a deep network. So again, uh, just reiterating what I just said, if you think about uh, a set of parameters of a deep network layer, they're going to automatically induce a partition 
of the input space of that particular layer into convex regions. And then if you compose several of these layers, we're going to form a non-convex partition of, uh, of the input space. And, and this provides really interesting, non-trivial links to classical ideas out of signal processing, information theory, computational geometry, namely ideas like vector quantization, k-means, and, and Voronoi tiles. And we'll, we'll get into these uh, as we go. So one of the yeah, key ideas is linking these modern deep net ideas back to more classical signal processing ideas. So let's just do a toy example so that you can visualize what goes on in one of these uh, uh, vector quantization partitions of the input spaces. So let's just consider a toy example, a three-layer net. We go from an input space that's two-dimensional. We're going to have four classes in the, in the uh, uh, two-dimensional input, 2D, just so we can visualize. Can't visualize really anything beyond 3D. We go to a layer of 45 units, then three units, and then we're going to do a four-class classification problem, so we have four units uh, on the output. Okay, makes sense to everybody? So uh, this, is the input, this is what goes on in the input space. We have four different classes with these four colors. Our goal is to build a classifier to, to tell these uh, apart. This is the uh, uh, first axis of the input space, the second axis. And this is what happens after we go through the first layer, right? To, to we go to 45, uh, 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 this, uh, the, the layer, the Maslow layer that maps the input to the output of, of this first layer. This is the vector quantization partition, or the spline uh, partition that, that, uh, that, that uh, you obtain. Importantly, we're going through a single layer. So the tiling is convex, right? These are convex regions, right? Make sense? Okay, moreover, let's remember that these are splines after all. So we can ask, well, what is the mapping from the input of the first layer to the output of the first layer? Well, it's just a very simple affine map because it's an affine spline after all, okay? That once you know a signal, right, a particular X lands in this particular tile, right, there is a, uh, uh, that, that gives you a particular uh, matrix A, right? And a offset vector B, right? That are different for every VQ tile. But then the mapping from the input to the output of that layer is just simply this affine map. So you can think of a, a, the, uh, the mapping from the input to the output of one deep net layer is just a VQ dependent affine transformation. So this is one layer. So now if we go through two layers, and we think of the partition induced on the input space, we now see that we start picking up non-convex, or we start having non-convex regions, because it's a non-convex uh, operator. However, we still have the same concept, right? That, that, that if a signal falls in this particular tile, right, this particular partition region, the mapping from the input to the output of the second layer remains just simply in a fine map, right? Where the A and the B are uh, uh, indexed uh, by this particular tile. And just to be super duper clear about it one more time, every signal that lives in this tile, that, that falls in this tile in the input space, has the exact same affine mapping, okay? And this is what happens when you learn, just to see, when you, if you initialize with random, uh, random weights, zero biases, you just get a set of cones. Uh, and as we go through learning epochs, you see that we uh, end up uh, uh, with these cones pulling away from the origin and then cones being cut up by other cones. And we result, again, for at least layers one and two, this particular mapping at, at convergence. Okay, and I, I'm going to, I think that it's really thinking of this geometrical picture is uh, a, a really uh, very useful to, to think about the inner workings of what's going on in a, in, a, in a deep network. In particular, a deep net is a VQ machine, right? It's computing a, a, ve a vector quantization. So, was there a question? Yeah. yeah. Why is initialization, uh, it looks like the second layer doesn't play a role. Why is it initialization it's just uh, clones from the origin? Uh, we set all, uh, let me just think if I got this right. We set all the biases to zero in the whole, in the whole network. Okay. So that's the affine map always is just A times X. Yeah. So, so we'll just. The second layer would, I mean. That's it's still, it's still, there's no B, there's no offset. So it's just going to remain. Cones of cones. Yeah, cones, cones of cones is just cones. Does that, that make sense? Okay, good. 
So uh, let's talk a, a little bit about uh, some of the geometrical properties. You can actually uh, delve deeper into the, what, the, the, the structure of these VQ tiles and show that, that the, part, the partition of, each, of a single layer, right, a single layer's input space in terms of the output is something called, it's actually not a Voronoi diagram, something called power diagram. Question, anybody here heard of power diagrams? Okay, fantastic. So it's a generalization of a Voronoi diagram. Now instead of just having a centroid, it has a centroid and a radius. All right, so it's a, it's a, it's a mild generalization of a Voronoi tiling. But the, uh, you basically you just uh, compute a Voronoi tiling but with something called a Legendre distance instead of the standard Euclidean distance. But the tiles remain convex, uh, convex polytopes, right, in, in high dimensional space. Moreover, given these uh, fine maps, given the, the entries in these uh, A matrices and these B off, uh, bias vectors, we have their, their closed form formulas for the centroids and the radii that determine all of these polytopes. So you can understand, you can study the, the, the geometry of these, the, the eccentricity, the size, uh, et cetera, by uh, thanks to the in closed form, thanks to these uh, uh, formulas. Moreover, it should be pretty clear that since you're uh, piling layers upon layers, that the, 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 uh, the po uh, a power diagram formed from, let's say, two uh, meso layers applied uh, in composition uh, is, is going to be formed by a subdivision process because the cutting of the cuts from the, uh, the second uh, input of the second layer to the output will basically cut the VQ tiling from the first layer, right? And so this is just an example of an input space tiling. Uh, first layer will just be a set of straight line cuts. Uh, the second layer is going to be a subdivision of those cuts. We colored them gray here, subdivision. But now the, the important thing is that the cuts are going to be bent, right? They're going to be bent at the gray boundaries, which are the boundaries defined by the first layer cuts. And these but, uh, these bands, you can actually compute bounds, for example, on the dihedral angles. Uh, and, and these uh, uh, bends are precisely to, main uh, to maintain continuity of the mapping from the input to the output of this operator. If you didn't have these bending, then you could have the spline become non-continuous. Uh, okay? But again, these bends are very important, and they have a lot to do with weight sharing in uh, deep, uh, deep networks. So one of the conclusions you can just take away from this part, part way through is that uh, deep networks are really a, 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 a very practical, very efficient way of doing something that is extremely difficult, which is free knot spline approximation in high deep. Right? That's, that's, that's really what uh, uh, deep, uh, deep networks uh, are doing. You can carry this all the way to the last layer in a classification problem, say, and study the, the decision boundary of the deep net. It is, again, just going to be one of these, basically just one of these cuts. And you can understand, for example, the, uh, the smoothness of the boundary by the fact that the, you, can, you can only have so much bending between the uh, cuts when you cut through the uh, 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 power diagram partition that you obtained from the, the previous region. So there's lots of things that can be done to understand, for example, smoothness of the decision boundaries in different uh, kinds of deep nets. So this is one direction that we've been exploring. The other is looking in particular at these affine mappings. So again, when you're in, in uh, a VQ tile, uh, you know that there's, for all signals that li live in that tile, there's just a, a, a affine map that goes from the input to the output. Uh, what, 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 uh, what, what properties can we, can we glean from these? Okay, so uh, in particular, if we think, let's just study the, the simple, uh, the, the, case of input to the output of the entire network, okay, which we'll call the Z big L. Uh, you can ignore the softmax. Uh, it doesn't really uh, enter into uh, any of the, the discussions I'm going to bring up. But we're interested in the mapping through all the layers of the network. The, 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 this affine mapping formula applies no matter where you are in the network. You'll just have different A's and B's. But we're interested in the one from the input to the very output. Okay from the input to the very output. We, you can develop closed form formulas for this map. 
particular for a conv net. This is what the A, uh, the A matrix looks like. Uh, this is what this offset B looks like. We can know all of these uh, matrices here in closed form. So you can do uh, different kinds of analyses. For example, look at the Lipschitz stability uh, to different points in the network based on different inputs. But the thing I'm most interested in talking about here is what, what are the rows of this A matrix look like? Because if you think about this, what is the output of the deep net? Right, everything up until the, the, the soft max. Well, it's basically just a matrix A multiplied, just ignore this, typo. It's this matrix A multiplied by my signal X plus a bias. Well, that, that, then that, this is just a vector. How big is this vector? There's one output for every class, right? I, uh, and and uh, what, how do I determine which class the input is? It's whichever uh, of these outputs is largest. Right? OK, so let's think. We have a matrix A that we're multiplying by our x. Each entry in this output is what? Just the inner product of a row of A with x. So what is that? Right? If we think about this matrix A, well, the cth row, right, corresponding to class C, is just, uh, we're just going to take the inner product of the cth row with x in order to get the cth output of z. We want to find the biggest. What's the, what's the, the uh, what do we call this in signal processing nomenclature? We call this a match filter bank, right? Because basically what we're doing is we're applying to our signal a set of filters by inner products. Cauchy-Schwarz tells us that the uh, more the filter looks like the input, the larger the output is going to be. Okay, and the optimal filter is what? Where the row is exactly the input. Right? This is standard, uh, standard uh, stuff that's done in you know, radar, signal processing, sonar, uh, uh, communication systems, uh, et cetera. And you can actually visualize this in a real network. So this is just CIFAR 10. Here's an input of an airplane. Here's the row. This, this is the, the row of the corresponding A matrix for that input, vector, uh, unvectorized so that it looks like an image. See, it looks, if you squint, it looks a lot like an airplane. OK, uh, has a large inner product. If you look at these other rows corresponding ship class, dog class, you see they don't actually look like a ship or a dog, but more like an anti-airplane, right, in order to push down the inner product. Largest inner product, smallest, uh, even smaller inner product. Okay. In fact, uh, yes, sir? So the bias here, you, you don't think about it. I didn't talk about the bias. But the way to think about the bias is uh, if, it, if, you, if you're a Bayesian, then the Bs would be related to the prior probabilities of the different classes. So if you knew that, that planes were very, very likely, you would, put, you would load B with a large number in uh, the, Bth, uh, the Bth entry. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, Rene. Not entirely, because B depends on X. Uh, yeah, so it's subtle, it's subtle, but you could think of this as like a, a, a dictionary learning machine that's basically given an input is, is, is uh, 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 defining then a, ba a Bayesian uh, classifier. Does, does that help a little bit? Okay. So, uh, uh, and, of and of course, uh, if you, if you uh, think what these uh, rows of these A matrix matrices are, uh, and you think of the fact that, that we're decomposing the deep net uh, input-output relationship in terms of uh, 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 affine maps, there's a, just a direct link between the rows of this A matrix and what are called saliency maps by, uh, by uh, the, the, the community. So it gives new uh, uh, intuition behind uh, what uh, goes on uh, or what, what happens when we, when we think about saliency maps. Moreover, if you, if you, if you, you can prove a, a simple result that, that says if you have a high capacity deep net uh, that's capable of, of producing basically any, an arbitrary A matrix, if you will, from a, from a given input, then you can show that the cth row of the A matrix when you input a piece of training data Xn is going to become exactly Xn when you're on the true class. Right, X is la uh, Xn's label, and essentially minus a constant times Xn when you are not in uh, when you're uh, uh, in a different class, and so this is this will tell us a little bit both about again reinforcing this match filter 
uh, uh, interpretation, but also helping us uh, understand a little bit about this memorization, uh, memorization process. Okay, a couple, uh, couple more points. So an another thing we can do is we can think now, because we, under we can have formulas for these affine maps, uh, we can characterize the uh, prediction function f that maps the input to the output. And we can think of different kind of complexity measures that we can derive out of these uh, uh, affine mapping uh, formulas. So uh, there's a lot of applications for uh, complexity measures. Uh, uh, for example, you might want to compare two deep networks, one which has a very uh, complicated uh, prediction function, uh, the other that, that, that solves the same task but has a much simpler uh, prediction function, Occam's razor type idea. We might also want to apply a complexity me measure as a penalty directly to our, to our learning process, right? So there's a large literature of, of deriving different uh, complexity measures and complexity penalties uh, uh, for deep nets. I'll just point to you know, two of them as, as examples. One is there's a very nice uh, recent paper that, that links the, uh, the ubiquitous two norm two norm of the weights penalty for learning to uh, a, a, a particular measure of the second derivative of the prediction function, right? So that it really does say that for at least a very, very simple kind of network, there's a, a link between the weight values of the weights uh, and uh, uh, the, the uh, wiggliness of f. And then uh, there's another school of approaches that looks at, well, we have a VQ tiling of the input space. Let's count the number of tiles. Because presumably, the more codes there are in your code book, the more tiles there are, the more complicated uh, the, the function that you're trying to approximate. So these are two approaches. I'm going to give one that, that, that really uh, expands upon these two. And it, it is leveraging the fact that we can uh, well, through leveraging really the, 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 uh, 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 the fact that lots of data sets, in particular image type data sets, we have a reasonable, uh, pro uh, reasonably true property that the, the, the training data live on low, lower, that doesn't have to be low dimensional, but lower dimensional manifolds, sub-manifolds of the high dimensional space. Okay, so let's assume that our data lives not filling up the entire uh, input space, but living on some lower dimensional submanifold or submanifolds, and and in this case we can we can look into the manifold learning literature, and there's a beautiful paper by Dunahan Grimes that defines what's called the Hessian eigenmap manifold learning technique, which uh, uh, is is basically trying to flatten a curvy manifold uh, using the uh, tangent Hessian along the manifold. So we can just adopt this this same measure, and we can define a complexity measure, C, as uh, the integral of the, of the tangent uh, Hessian along the manifold. So you can just think of it, uh, uh, roughly speaking, as the low, low you have f. It's a, piece, it's a continuous piecewise affine function. And what we're looking at is the local deviation of f from flat. So if f, if f of x was a completely flat function, this measure would be 0. If f was ver is very jaggedy, meaning locally, when you look over a few regions, it's jumping up and down wildly, this will be a large, this will be a large uh, uh, number. Yes? Um, forgive me if it's an ignorant question, but how is no. locality defined here? Pardon me? How is locality defined here? Oh, simply by integrating along this, uh, basically we're just integrating along the tangent manifold. So, this is the so we have, pardon? Fixed and given, if I'm doing yes, yes, yeah. And you could also, you know, just integrate over the entire space, but then you lose some of the nice, uh, some of the nice properties. Does, does that help, Zach? Uh, oh, yeah, and we can talk, we can talk about it after. So uh, it, uh, the if, nice thing about this measure is that you can develop a Markov, uh, 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 a Monte Carlo approximation. Uh, in terms of the training data points, the XNs that are your training data points, and the affine mapping parameters. So it's actually extremely uh, uh, e uh, easy to actually compute the value of C given a set of tra training points and giving the affine mapping parameters. Are you going to talk about P in the vision? No, I, I won't. Let's just, just think of P as 2 for right now. But 
if the, if the medical is higher dimensional and the P is 2, then this, this is problematic. Uh, yeah, so, so the... The minimizer of this thing would be singular. Yeah, ideally you will choose the P depending on the particular, for example, the manifold dimension, the ambient dimension, et cetera. We, yeah, let's, let's talk about it at, at the break. Uh, uh, sorry, just for yes. Clarity, so this manifold is manifold of X? This is the, da yeah, da let's, the data manifolds. Assume the training data are samples from some submanifold in, uh, in the ambient space. Because there are two factors that can increase C. One is F, the other is the manifold, right? Uh, you mean uh, the smoothness of the manifold, say? Yeah. Yeah, ab absolutely. But, but if, if we just assume, let's just say you have two, two prediction functions, and their domain in both cases is the same manifold, then that would be normalized out, right? Yes? Sorry, a uh, follow-up question. Yeah. Are you no longer working with ReLUs here? This is where Ray lives, absolutely. Or piecewise, piece uh, convex, piecewise affine nonlinearities. Isn't the Hessian then zero everywhere except for pieces where it's offline? Uh, no. Let, yeah, let's talk, about, let's talk about it offline because I think otherwise I'll run out of time. Yeah, it, it won't be. Yeah. Okay, so let, let's, uh, let's look at an application of this uh, to uh, something that is, uh, I would say, somewhat still mysterious in uh, the deep learning world, and that is data, the, the data augmentation. So if we think of uh, how deep networks are trained today, uh, they're typically trained with this technique called data augmentation, that we don't just feed in images of bin, right? We feed in images of translates, right? Of bin, uh, rotations of bin, uh, et cetera. And if we uh, uh, have a hypothesis that the images of bin somehow came from a lower dimensional manifold in high dimensional space where points on that manifold were translates and rotations of each other, then the, it's very convenient that these augmented data points that are generated from just your raw initial training data will live on the same data manifold. Okay? So there's a, in, this per, in this particular uh, setting, uh, you, can, you can prove a result that says that uh, uh, just uh, starting with uh, uh, writing out the uh, the cost, uh, say cross entropy cost function uh, with data augmentation terms, you can actually develop that, those data augmentation terms and pull them out of the, 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 the uh, first part of the cost function and show that uh, they basically form a, uh, uh, the, this Hessian penalty, uh, this he Hessian complexity regularization penalty. Okay, and so what that's saying is that uh, data augmentation implicitly implements a Hessian complexity regularization on the, the optimization. Okay, so that's like the theorem. Here's two, uh, or just a simple experiment with the uh, CIFAR 100 data set. So this is training epix in the uh, uh, x-axis, this uh, complexity measure uh, in the vertical axis. And all we're doing here is uh, we're, as we're training the network, Train, trained without data augmentation in black and with data augmentation in blue, what we're looking at are based on the A's and the B's that we have, the, the, uh, that we have learned uh, with the network. We're plugging that into our complexity measure that was on the previous, uh, previous slide. And we're seeing that the measure is showing that the, uh, uh, the network that is learned uh, using data augmentation has far lower complexity than the network that is learned uh, with data augmentation. This is both on the training and on the test data. Yeah? Wouldn't the kind of implicit regularization depend on the loss? And is this implicit Hessian arising due to a uh, two-square loss? Oh, yeah, good question. Uh, well, in this case, we, it was, uh, was cross-entropy loss. Yeah, it wasn't that, wasn't we weren't. Different, different losses would be yeah, different um, ones because effectively what you're saying with the data annotation is that two similar images have the same label. Yeah. And so the loss will compare those labels. And so that has to change, the, the regularization has to change depending on the loss. So, let me just say, let me just So how could all losses lead to the same regularization? Yeah, let, uh, 
let, let's, yeah, so for, so for just for now, in the interest of time, let's just assume cross entropy loss for a classification problem rather than L2, uh, L2 loss for a regression problem. And then let me think, and maybe I'll have a, a better answer by the time uh, we get to questions. Yeah. Very quick, like uh, the complex measure is only a function of the model, but not the loss. Is that right? Uh, absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. Okay. So let's uh, uh, one last quick uh, quick uh, note. Uh, what can we do beyond piecewise affine uh, deep nets? Because uh, the, the sigmoid, hyperbolic tan, these are still very uh, useful in certain applications, in particular in recurrent uh, deep nets. And it turns out that you can bring those under the same uh, umbrella uh, that, uh, uh, th of, of this maxifying spline uh, framework. And the way to do that is to switch from a deterministic hard vector quantization approach or, 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 or way of thinking where uh, if x lives in, a, in this particular vector quantization tile, it definitively lives in that vector quantization tile to a soft VQ approach where now we just we have uh, a, a probability that x will fall in a given uh, vector quantization tile where uh, for this particular signal maybe it has a high probability in this tile somewhat smaller in the local uh, local uh, uh, neighboring tiles and then decreasing probability as, as you move away so if you just set up a very simple gaussian mixture model uh, where the means and covariances are based on these A's and B's that we derive, you can, you can uh, 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 basically derive uh, uh, no, nonlinearities like the sigmoid, like the softmax, directly from ReLU, uh, uh, absolute value, and other uh, uh, piecewise affine convex uh, uh, nonlinearities. Uh, non and in particular, if you, if you do a look at a hybrid approach, it's, it's between a hard VQ and a soft VQ, right? With where you're basically blending between the two, you can generate infinite classes of interesting uh, and potentially useful nonlinearities. And I'll just point out one: uh, how many people here have heard of the Swish nonlinearity? A few. So this was a, a nonlinearity that was discovered a few years ago through an empirical search. Right? It's an empirical search for is there a nonlinearity that works better than ReLU, right, for large scale classification problems. And uh, it turned out there, there, there was, and it was a fairly sizable, you know, non trivial gain in a lot of cases. And it's this black dashed line here. And the interesting thing, it's hard to know if it's a coincidence or not, but if you look at the, in some sense, the midway point between hard VQ and soft VQ, uh, based on uh, the, the ReLU function at the hard v VQ uh, side and the sigmoid gated linear unit at the soft VQ, the swish is precisely halfway in between. Okay, which is quite, quite uh, kind of uh, interesting. Okay, and you can also uh, 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 pull out sigmoid hyperbolic tangent by adopting a, a probabilistic viewpoint of the output of a layer no longer being just a deterministic output of the input, but instead the probabilities that you fall in the different VQ regions in the, in the, the input. Okay? So that's what we can do beyond piecewise. Uh, fine. So I better wrap up. So what I've you know, hoped to get across is that uh, th this spline, in particular maxifying spline viewpoint, can provide a useful you know, language to talk about the things that we're learning about deep networks, but also frame the kind of questions uh, that we would like to uh, 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 move forward with. I, I talked a bit about uh, the, the basic you know, framework of maxifying splines and deep nets. I talked about the relationships with, with vector quantization and really that a deep net is, a, you could think of it as a vector quantization machine or you could think of it as a, a free knot spline uh, machine. Uh, there's there are some really, I think, interesting links between uh, power diagrams from computational geometry and uh, the, the subdivision that's generated by this layer upon layer maxifying spline uh, process. Uh, this, uh, the, the affine transformations that, that, that we derive based on the, these it, based in these different VQ regions allow us to link deep nets back to old school signal processing ideas like match filter banks.
and they allow us to define new kinds of uh, complexity measures, in particular this Hessian measure that we talked about. So I'll end there uh, and say there's some, some papers if people would like to take a peek, and I'd be happy to answer any uh, additional questions. Can I ask an earlier question? Sure. How do you compute the second derivative of a piecewise affine function? So the yeah, so the uh, basically the 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 way the way that we think about it is that you have a um, if, if okay, there's 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 let's talk about the heur heuristic way of thinking about it is if you had a piecewise affine function, it's going to be undefined at the obviously at the kinks, right? But if you th if you think of Basically, uh, a, a heur a, some heuristic way to smooth any heuristic way you can think of to smooth out that kink, then the second derivative is, is going to be related to the slope parameters on one side and the slope parameters on the other side. And the bandwidth of smooth. yeah, exactly, and the bandwidth of the smoothing. That's the epsilon that that was in that oh, in that see. formula. There's a there there are details that we could you know we could talk about at the break. Yes. Have you seen? In the training, how does your complexity measure change? Does it get smoother or? Uh, you mean the vat, like how large the measure? Yeah, so that was what this, yeah, the, the point of this experiment was really to look at, as, as we are training, so as we're going through training uh, epochs, what is happening, you know, what is the value of the, in this case, the value of this complexity measure as we train the network through the various training, training cycles, both with, in this case, with data augmentation and in this case, without data augmentation. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. I have a quick question about your soft, soft uh, VQ. Yes. Can you give more insight? So basically, you have a nonlinearity. You subtract it from ReLU and add ReLU. Is that how you do it? Uh, no, but you I just. I don't understand how you would get the partitions if it's not, if it's not affine, right? So if it, just in a nutshell, think of, uh, Think of a, 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 a Gaussian mixture model. A Gaussian mixture model defined in terms of covariances, means and covariances, where now the means and covariances are defined in terms of these different tiles. But there so, is no tile. It's pardon not, me? There is no tile if the nonlinearity is not, it's, it's not it's was affine, right? There is a tile. So the, OK, uh, what's the best way to describe it? So start from a. Start from a uh, hard VQ where we have a tiling. Now you have, because of the power diagram, you have a radius and you have a, a centroid. Now use that radius and that centroid as the per, basically to develop a Gaussian mixture model. For example, a uh, 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 you know uh, uh, circularly symmetric Gaussian mixture with that particular the radius being the the, the variance. Now under that, if you think in terms of now under that model. Uh, you'll have a given an input. You can think about the probability that it falls into each of these individual tiles will be determined by the probability under that particular each of those mixtures. Does that make sense? And if you put if if you now look at these probabilities, these probabilities behave like in in the case of say you start with the tiling derived from a ReLU, you will you will end up with a set of probabilities that are. Uh, that, that, that follow the functional form of a sigmoid gated linear unit in that case. So does, that, does that help? I mean, if I have a, if I have a neural network that is not this was affine, that's already trained, you can, I mean, there is no type, right? You agree? Oh, OK, OK. So then, you know, you, I, my question is I assume there is a procedure to have right. something coming. So can we go backwards, yeah. you're saying? Yeah. Uh, I need to think about that. Yeah. We were thinking only in the one, one direction. Going from a hard VQ to a soft VQ, presumably you could reverse that process by, uh, if you have a, 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 a per certain, uh, but it would have to be not all possible nonlinearities are reachable via this, so this, this soft uh, or, or, or relaxation of this hard VQ, right? You can't reach, you can't reach arbitrary. Uh, you can't reach arbitrary nonlinearities, right? Only certain kind of nonlinearities. If you wanted to reach arbitrary ones, you would have to. There's no way you could do that with just a Gauss, standard kind of Gaussian mixture framework. 
Does that help? Yeah. Yes. Um, can I go back to the complex measure versus changing time? Sure. Um, Where are we here? Just a very, very quick question. Um, so it sounds like uh, for the test, uh, sorry, for the no DA after 150 epoch, there's no number. Is it just because uh, it blows up? Or some, does something happen like the epoch? Oh, no, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. No, we just, this is an artifact of the plotting. We sure, probably should have stopped the okay. plot here. Yeah. Good question. Yes? Um, how does this complexity measure depend on the number of examples? So, like, if you train on more examples of the complexity measure? We, like a total number of examples? Yeah. Yeah, so the, that's a really good question. Uh, because in fact, we're, uh, we're only, uh, the, the way that we compute, okay, there, there's the complexity measure and then there's the computation of the approximation of the complexity measure. Uh, the more training samples you have, the more densely you will sample the manifold, the, the signal manifold, and the Tr closer your approximation will be to the true, the true measure. And so the more training data that, that, that you have, the, the closer you'll get to the true measure. Yeah, so that's a really good question. Oh, maybe that's um, yeah. quick, quick question. So there are methods that attempt to do adaptive knot selection for smoothing supplies, like trend filtering. And yeah. Um, and you can apply it with some modifications to multivariate data and get adaptive filings. There. Yeah, yeah. But is there some sense of, so, so it would give you similar results. It's right. Just Hierarchical v VQ would be another. Yeah, yeah, but v yeah. Yeah, yeah. is there some sense of what the properties of these quantizations and these tilings are that will differentiate you from something that's that more directly tries to penalize these yeah. complexities? Yeah, I mean, as a, to me, this is, this is the. This is a this is a really key que un key unanswered question, right? What the question was there that th there are, you know, there are a number of uh, 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 different ways to try to find different free knot spline approximations in higher dimensions, uh, and uh, why are deep you know how are deep nets you know different or better? And this this is a big question. Uh, I, un and an unanswered question. Uh, there, there's no question that, that uh, the you know, methods that we use, the you know, current training methods, our optimization approaches are enabling us to find these free knot spline approximations in you know, truly ridiculously high dimensions, right? Where uh, a lot of these other techniques, you wouldn't even attempt them, right? But still, it does not mean that this is the, that we've, that, that we've stumbled on the best way of, of doing this. So I think that as we, I uh, think of new kinds of optim new kinds of optimization uh, methods, for example, or new kinds of architectures. We're finding new ways to hierarchically build up these uh, these spline partitions, and eventually we'll find out that there are some ways that are better uh, than other ways, and we're probably not even you know partway there yet. Okay, I guess uh, let's thank the speaker again. Okay, thank you.